on 9-11, I worked at New York Hospital, which is the largest burn center um, in, in the country. And up until the time that the towers collapsed, our emergency room was just a mass of people really working, clearing people out who didn't need to be there. People were beginning to come in. And then when the towers collapsed, the emergency room became dead silent. It was the worst feeling of my life. I'll never forget that. And by three o'clock, we realized there was not going to be anything for us to do. You're listening to an American Red Cross in Greater New York podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Michael DeVolpierre, communications officer for the American Red Cross in Greater New York. Through this podcast, we've been trying to highlight the different ways that disasters can impact our lives and shine a light on the everyday heroes who work to meet the complex challenges that result from these emergencies. When disasters strike, be they natural or man-made, large or small, disasters turn lives upside down. From one moment to the next, disasters can destroy our homes, our possessions, and our livelihoods. And they can also take from us those that we hold dearest, like our pets and our loved ones. Most people know and understand the tangible ways that the Red Cross comes to the aid of a disaster survivor. We provide safe shelter, we serve and deliver meals, we distribute relief supplies, and at times we tend to the physical ailments that disaster victims are suffering from. But what fewer people understand are the ways we address the invisible wounds, emotional and spiritual, that these tragic events can inflict. Today's conversation will focus on disaster spiritual care, which means the process of helping people make sense of their loss and helping people use their own faith, whatever that may be, to cope and eventually recover. Today's guest is Rabbi Stefan Roberts, one of the pioneers of disaster spiritual care at the American Red Cross. As part of our conversation, we talked about the meaning of his unique support, as well as some of the loss he experienced that strengthened his resolve to carry on his volunteer work. So joining me here for this interview is Andrew Sindel, volunteer recruitment manager and also a member of the podcast team. Welcome, Andrew. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew, for coming. And Rabbi Stefan Roberts, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to, to talk to you and to hear about your insight. You've had a, a fascinating Red Cross career and just so much to talk to us about. So welcome again. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a 20-year volunteer with Red Cross. I just got received my 20-year pin, which is really hard to imagine, except for the fact that my grandfather had a 50-year pin. So I'd love to just take a step back to, to you and um, uh, prior to joining the Red Cross and getting a little bit um, more information about your background. Um, where are you from? Um, what led you to, to this organization and to where you are today? So maybe just talk about where you're from in general. Sure. I'm a native of South Florida. And growing up, I remember my grandfather actually taught CPR. So even as a, as a young child, I remember my grandfather lugging around all the, di the different, you know, Red Cross paraphernalia. Um, he taught first aid. He taught life-saving. And so I, as a rabbi, but I as a Jew, had an unusual background in seeing somebody in my family involved in Red Cross. Coming into the rabbinate was a second career. I have an MBA from the Wharton School in both marketing and finance. I worked in corporate America for a number of years before getting a call. And one of the big moments in my life that actually led me to Red Cross was there was a plane crash outside of Dallas um, that went down, a Delta plane crash, and I knew three people on the plane. One of the people on the plane was like another brother to me. His name was Scott, grew up on my street. And he died in that plane crash along with the person he was traveling with. The third person I knew was the sister of a classmate of mine, and she was part of the group as a flight attendant who walked away. To this day, I remember the call I received telling me that Scott had died in this plane crash. I remember so much about that experience. But what really stayed with me was the deeply professional disaster spiritual care provided by the rabbis in my community. It allowed me at one of the worst moments of my life to move forward spiritually. And that really is, is key for me because 
after I became a rabbi, after I became a professional chaplain, about five years after that happened, Red Cross and the major board certification professional chaplaincy groups started working together. And I was part of the very first group that was trained and became part of Red Cross. And that was 20 years ago. And one of the key reasons that I got involved was to pass forward the spiritual care that I had received that allowed me ultimately to go into rabbinic school and ultimately to have a deeply spiritual life. So when the opportunity came for me to pay something forward, I really was appreciative. Because of my own grandfather's years with the Red Cross, it made so much sense to me to say this is an organization my family loves, values, and that I wish to be part of. How old were you? Um when this accident occurred in this plane? I, at that time, was 24, 25. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, your journey as a rabbi, you know, how you got into that rabbinic field and kind of how that, you know, led your journey to the Red Cross? And we're curious a little bit about that. I became a rabbi when I was a little before 30. I'd been working in corporate America. I had my MBA. I found it very satisfying. Um, But I went through a job search, and at the end of the job search, I realized I'd rather do what I love than what I like. And what I loved was what I was doing nights, weekends, with my spiritual community. And I went down to a large 5,000 gathering of my national movement. It was really there on a Sabbath morning that I had a call and decided to be a rabbi and got back and within a week had applied to seminary and with a few months had been accepted and started six months later. And I really thought I would find a way to use my business expertise along with my rabbinic calling. In rabbinic school, my third year, it's a five-year program, I ended up spending a summer doing hospital work, professional training, and I just fell in love with it. It just was, uh, I worked with people of all faiths and of no faith, which is critical to the work we do in Red Cross. We work with people of all faiths and no faith. I was training to work with people of all faith and no faith to help them make meaning of the moment in which they found themselves in. And and as a um, healthcare chaplain, that's what we do. Part of that journey then is upon ordination, I decided to become a professional board certified chaplain. And I spent an additional year in this, what's known as clinical pastoral education of training. A key part of that training prepared me directly for Red Cross, and that was in the emergency room. I spent each week four, eight, ten hours working in an emergency room. And the work that we do in an emergency room providing spiritual care is exactly the same work that we do in a disaster. One, I don't know who I'm walking into. I know nothing about their background. Um, I know that something has occurred in their life or their family's life that has them no longer in a place in which they used to be. And so my job, what I learned in that emergency room, was how to meet somebody where they are and and how to begin the process of them making meaning of the situations in which they're finding themselves in. And that situation, whether it's an emergency room with somebody whose loved one has had a heart attack or been in an accident, is no different than working with somebody in Tornado Alley whose house has just been destroyed. Their life is radically changed, and now they have to begin to call on their own spiritual resources to help them make meaning of the moment and their spiritual resources to go forward. And that's what my training did. And that training so prepared me for my work here in Red Cross. Do you have a story from that time um, that has stuck with you that you would want to share with us? (sighs) Possibly someone that you interacted with, someone that you helped, um, that that particularly touched you, that has stuck with you since? Yes. Um, The first time I met this family, we're just going to call them Abraham, um, Sarah, and Rebecca. So Rebecca was 13 at the time. 
she was a young woman, and I met her in the emergency room. Um, and her father worked as a security guard in the hospital. And um, she was very, very ill. And I really got to know her. And, and, and she was a patient in and out of the hospital over a two-year period. And I worked with her, helping her make meaning of what it meant as a 13-year-old and then as a 14 or 15-year-old to make meaning about what was life for her living with illness. But equally important, I worked with her two parents. Her mother was a nurse, her father security guard in, in the hospital. What was it like for them to have their life radically changed? Where they were looking at the unknown. They didn't know what life was going to bring them over those two years. She got stronger. There was so much hope. She came back in. She ultimately died. It was devastating to, the, to them, to me. And part of the work I did continued with them was help them make meaning of how to go forward. What did God, higher power, creator, the source what was that in their lives? How had it changed? How had their spiritual life changed? And, and what spiritual tools did they have at these moments of pain that they could call upon to help them at their moment of, of really deepest loss? So Rabbi Roberts, when 9-11 occurred, you were at the time a chaplain in a local hospital, and you were at the same time volunteering with the Red Cross. You had spent the past few months and even years working to build the spiritual care program at the Greater New York Chapter. Um, can you walk us through the, the hours and days and months after 9-11 and your role in that response? On 9-11, I worked at New York Hospital, which is the largest burn center um, in, in the country. And we were expecting so many people when 9-11 when happened. And I and all the other professional chaplains, we were in the emergency room that day. And up until the time that the towers collapsed, our emergency room was just a mass of people really working, clearing people out who didn't need to be there. People were beginning to come in. And then when the towers collapsed, the emergency room became dead silent. It was the worst feeling of my life. I'll never forget that. And by three o'clock, we realized there was not going to be anything for us to do. And at that point, I approached the management, my management, about being deployed to Red Cross. I would already made a call and was told by Virginia, when was I asked, actually, how soon was I planning to be in? Um, I received a two-week deployment from my hospital, um, and by 5 o'clock I was in Red Cross on 9-11, and I worked with the team that was there at the time, and we just went forward. All the work that we had done prior to that, we implemented. And the next day, of the 11 people that were on my management team, by 8 o'clock the next morning, 10 had shown up. and with. Over the course of 9-11, we had over 800 disaster spiritual care volunteers through American Red Cross, just through uh, New York. Can you talk about how you um, manage your own grief and emotions in these moments um, to be able to still effectively offer that support that you're providing? Absolutely. Part of my training as a professional board certified chaplain is to be able to understand what is my grief and what is somebody else's grief? And to make sure that I'm always in touch with my own grief, to be able to name it, to talk about it, to share, and at times to be able to say, at this moment I can't deal with it and set it aside. And then later, part of the board certified chaplain, what I do is I have a supervisor I work with, a personal supervisor. At that time, I was in a support group, which we met twice a month for 90 minutes, twice a month with other professional chaplains. There were eight of us. We'd already been meeting two years before this. We continued to meet for another four years. We're, all of us continued to work being in touch with our emotions. Rabbi Roberts, can you 
Uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the differences between your rabbinic training, maybe, and how uh, the spiritual care training works. I know a lot of what you do in spiritual care and your fellow volunteers is you're working with people from all different faiths. And I'm curious how that um, has evolved and how that um, component really works. As a rabbi, I'm trained to be a religious leader. I'm trained to teach and to preach. It's a very set specific set of skills that I went to seminary for five years. Amazing set of skills. As a board-certified professional chaplain and as somebody who provides disaster spiritual care, our job is not not to preach and teach in a disaster. Rather, it's to call upon somebody to help them inventory their own spiritual tools and to make meaning of where they are and to help them determine what spiritual and religious tools do I have to help me in this moment and the moments going together. But I want to really be clear, majority of who volunteers for American Red Cross for our disaster spiritual care program are congregational clergy. And most congregational clergy get what it means to work with people outside their own faith. Because in America today, we're always working with people outside of our own faith. That's the mosaic of American society. There isn't a faith leader in our society who somebody isn't married to somebody of another faith tradition. And the best of our congregational leaders, the best of our faith leaders, because what American Red Cross looks for are really what we talk about our faith leaders because not everyone is clergy. Some traditions don't use the word clergy, but the leaders in our program, the faith leaders who qualify in disaster spiritual care, they're all comfortable working with people of all faiths and of no faith. One of the reasons people are comfortable is that we're not normatively providing religious care. We're providing spiritual care. And the difference is that I'm not leading a service when I'm with Red Cross. Um, Just not something that I do. Rather, I'm helping somebody inventory their own spiritual tools, inventory their religious needs. And oftentimes, I do help them meet their religious needs. Somebody's Roman Catholic and somebody's died and they need a rosary or they need a pin. My job then is to help them get that. If somebody needs a Bible, somebody needs a Quran, somebody needs a a, a book of Psalms, part of the assessment that I do as as an American Red Cross disaster spiritual care volunteer is to assess their needs, both their spiritual needs and religious needs, and then as part of a larger team, help them meet those needs. Is it, um, is it sometimes difficult for someone who, of a different faith who's experienced tragedy um, to accept and to be approached by someone from a different faith like yourself? In my experience, 95% of the people don't have an issue. In their grief and in their needs, they're open to those who have clear boundaries and borders who understand what their role is. The only time that they're not comfortable is when we violate those boundaries. Robert Roberts, I know you had some uh, additional personal experience with the Red Cross during Superstorm Sandy, um, and you were affected personally. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and kind of how that ties into your uh, role today and what that meant to um, see the work of the Red Cross on a personal way. So I'd been a volunteer with the American Red Cross for 15 years by the time Hurricane Sandy happened. I live very close in Manhattan to the Hudson River, and my home was destroyed by Hurricane Sandy. We had three feet of salt water in my home. And I went like every other person who walks into a Red Cross facility in a heartbeat, I went from providing to giving to needing to receive. And and there was one very specific moment in which I was really at a low point. And I received from American Red Cross, from their disaster spiritual care team, I had a 15-minute interaction that to this day I still remember. 
And it really helped me in a way that was transformative, that helped me really do all the, everything that I do for others. Somebody did for me. You can't do it on your own. You know, you just can't oftentimes, you know, you know doctors should never doctor themselves, and, 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 and spiritual care providers can't spiritual care ourselves. And in that deeply moving encounter, it helped me make meaning the fact that my home had been destroyed, that 42 of my neighbors' homes had been destroyed, that when I looked out in my backyard, most of my, my possessions were in my backyard at that point. Um, when I went to look for something, it wasn't there because it was no longer. And all the work that I do with people, somebody did with me, helped me to assess my spiritual tools, helped me to really start the work of making meaning. I never thought I would be the recipient. I just, I just never did. And again, I'm just so grateful. And 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 it's having been a recipient. It just makes me want to serve more and more, um, to give back, to pay forward again that which I've received and 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 it, you know I know personally at the worst time of my life what Red Cross means what was it the, does I'm sorry uh, what was it about that moment or about that person um, that made that interaction so helpful he wasn't there to make things better for me he was there to walk with me at the worst moments in my life. And that's what our disaster spiritual care volunteers do, is we walk with people. We listen. We do reflective listening. We're there so somebody knows that however they understand God, higher power, creator, the source, um, or they may not have any of that language, they may, they may not believe in God, to know they're not alone. And what he was able to do was to practice our principles of universality, which is so critical in a disaster. He lived what it meant to be impartial. And that's what we see in disaster spiritual care. Why we work with people of all faiths and of no faith is that it's both universal and impartial. And in those two, we see the other principle of Red Cross, which is unity. I'm curious, uh, going back to when you first uh, became a volunteer for the Red Cross, obviously you had the family uh, ties to the American Red Cross and decided to volunteer for the organization. But when making your decision, um, what else about the Red Cross you know, drew you to being part of the organization? And what would be your advice for others who are looking to give back and make a difference in the community? How do you go about that um, journey? So what drew me to Red Cross in particular was that it was creating this disaster spiritual care program, and there wasn't anything else like it. And the one advice that I have for anyone who's looking to be a volunteer with the Red Cross, the disaster spiritual care motto is Simper Gumby, which means be flexible. Um, and I think that applies to anyone who's with Red Cross. We're a dynamic disaster organization. We'll ask you to show up in one place and you'll get there, and we won't be there because we've already... In, in the last hour, had to switch where we are. We'll deploy you and then make you sit for 24 hours because we are in process. We're moving. We're shifting. We're a large organization. And if you're not flexible, this is not a good volunteer opportunity for you. If you're flexible, this is the best volunteer opportunity for anyone. What we'll give you as a volunteer is meaning in your life. And, and, and that's really what this organization helps to provide is meaning, helping people see the best in, in, in the world. Rabbi Roberts, I just wanted to uh, say thank you personally for all that you've done for the organization. I have the experience of working with uh, so many talented volunteers and the skills and the qualities that you exemplify really are um, what we look for, like you mentioned, in many of our volunteers. So you've really done some tremendous work, and we can 
hear the passion and dedication in uh, all that you've told us today. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, and thank you for all you do. It's been a really incredible conversation. And, and one final word to anyone listening. Think of volunteering and think of donating. You'll never regret it. Big thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to hear more, please share, like, subscribe, or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. As a new podcast, we really want to hear from you, our listeners. To learn more about the work of the Red Cross, visit redcross.org. This episode was produced and edited by Chi Kong Lu. Special thanks to Michael Freiberg and Connor Lennon for their support. Thank you all for listening, and we hope you join us for the next episode.